To what degree do computers help with mathematics? Throughout much of history, math has been done by humans in their brains and writing some things down. Writing some things down. But now with computers and calculators everywhere, there's a funny mix of times when a proof from a human was not enough to solve a problem and when we needed to use the help from some sort of computing device to solve a problem and other times where computers think they have solved things when they actually haven't and can give absurdly bad advice. So today we are going to look at times when computers helped with mathematics as well as sometimes which we're going to begin with when computers gave ridiculously stupid answers to things and i do have to show you folks some personal experiences i've had with robots that i think you might find hilarious now i'm not the biggest fan of technology I just don't have that much fun with digital things compared to something natural. With that said, I will be editing this episode digitally. I made the soundtracks here in a digital way. And there are many digital types of technology that do benefit my life. If I want to know what some fractions decimal is, or nowadays I could even go on like my favorite online calculator is Wolfram Alpha. If I ask that site, what are the first five prime numbers that end in the digit nine? They'll tell me. They can interpret that human language into mathematics and solve the mathematics for me which can be greatly helpful for a mathematician. You know, it's sometimes a misconception maybe that mathematicians are the people who are really good at doing arithmetic. Uh, I don't know if that's the case. Mathematicians are creative at when to use arithmetic, but a lot of mathematicians enjoy help from calculators. So when I heard about a very popular modern phenomenon, known as ChatGPT or OpenAI software, where you could basically make a free account and ask some robot questions and it would respond to you in its attempt at a human or animal sort of way, and apparently even a mathematical way. I had read articles that apparently this ChatGPT was a threat to college institutions and that many students were copying this verbatim for their answers on essays and tests and stuff. And so I figured, well, this is a language processing software, but maybe it's half decent at mathematics as well. A lot of these news articles are acting like it's way smarter than a typical calculator. So I figured maybe we'll play around and ask this thing a few questions. Now I know many people will say that this is just trying to be a language model and not trying to be a mathematical calculator. But not only has the general media held its math skills to high acclaim, but it also seems that it seems to think quite highly of its own math skills as well. Like when I asked it, do you know basic arithmetic and simple facts about numbers? It told me, yes, I do. I have been trained on a vast amount of text data, which includes basic arithmetic and simple facts about numbers. Feel free to ask me any arithmetic or mathematical questions. Now, when I say that this program is quite faulty at mathematics, I don't just mean if it's trying to do something complicated. You can ask this robot something quite simple, and it will find some way or another to give you a wrong answer. I asked it, for example, tell me something interesting about the number one. They said one interesting fact about the number one is that it is the only number 
with the property that the sum of the reciprocals of all of the positive integers is equal to one. With this completely nonsensical statement, because the sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers would be a divergent series that would approach infinity and definitely already be past one after a single number. They then say that this can be proven using the formula for the sum of an infinite geometric series and give a lot of nonsensical answers that at first the robot thought were adding toward a proof. And at some point, I believe this robot realized that to get to the end result, they were going to have to conclude something along the lines of one plus one half is equal to one. So rather than admitting defeat, this robot said that one plus one half equals one. Similarly, this robot, in one of its responses, told me that 2 not only equals 1 plus 1, but also equals 1 times 1. And when I asked it to clarify, I thought that it would probably admit some sort of mistake. Uh, no, it gave me a proof that 2 apparently equals 1 times 1. Then when I asked it about the number 1 half, it thought that that was not only the multiplicative identity, but also the additive identity. And you know what? One third is also the multiplicative identity and additive identity. And pretty much any number you ask this robot about, it will say is several types of identity. Or how about this? One half is apparently smaller than one fourth because fractions represent division and one fourth is a smaller division than one half. So, like I feel like this is seriously squirrel level math these computers are getting wrong. Now, hopefully you won't ask this to try and prove anything important because when I asked it if it could prove whether there were an infinite amount of twin primes, an open question, one of the bigger unsolved things in number theory, it was quite confident that it had proven this within a few paragraphs of gibberish. Now, since this did seem like a potential mathematical resource, I also did try to take it seriously and ask it some questions that I was curious about and hold its hand while I built up some instructions for it to follow. And it was terrible at that, partially because it didn't want to try. Whenever I would bother it enough, it would eventually give me the right answer, but without my human brain to check when we stop the no actually try agains and when we settle on something being the final correct answer, it would have just been spitting out nonsense at a wall and hoping that something sticks. Sometimes I would ask it a question and it would act like some random wrong guess was the best it could do. But if I probed it just a tiny bit harder and kind of put it on the spot, like, no, actually, you gotta tell me what is going on there, it turned out it actually knew the answer. Perhaps this makes sense. Websites like this and programs want to minimize how much resources each given consumer uses for the company. They're a company. I was a consumer, even though I wasn't a paying one. As a consumer of one of these companies, they don't always want to invest 
all of the computer power to give you the answer that they would be able to calculate. Sometimes they just want to get you off of their back instead of asking them enough detailed questions that it actually strains their computer processors to any degree. And as I looked online to see if other people had this experience, I did find, although this is subjective, that some people who actually pay for this ChatGPT open AI, newer versions of the software, have found that they think at different times it has begun to try less hard with them or care less about them as a consumer. So we have to remember that, that when we're dealing with robots that some company makes, that it's not just about the potential accuracy, it's about is that accuracy profiting the company? And if not, does the company really care about giving you that accuracy? This is less of a criticism of any one current modern company and more of a warning for all of you to be skeptical. If you ever hear any future news about any other robots supposedly being amazing at mathematics. Now, with all those criticisms said, it's still cool that nowadays we have computing devices that we can ask questions to. I wish some of them were a little less cocky about the responses they'd give, and I wish the media was a little less sensationalist about how new and groundbreaking each new one might be. But it's cool that we can ask robots questions and they might be able to help us. <laughs> now, computers aren't only stupid, computers have also helped animals. As an example of a time when computers actually helped animals to solve a proof, we're going to look at maps. Now, here we got a globe, which ends up following the same traits of what we're going to describe. But let's talk about 2D maps. Let's say I had some strange map that either was some real place I subdivided into cities or continents or states or whatever sort of region you chose, or maybe one I made up for an alien planet for some fiction book. Let's say I wanted to draw this map so that no two touching or neighboring sections were the same color. How many colors would I have to paint the entire map? Like if this one was green, obviously none of these could be green because they're all touching it in some way. But in this case, we could maybe make this one blue. That couldn't be blue, it'd have to be a different color, but that could be blue. These in between ones, maybe we'd color red. And in this case, we would get a three colored map where none of the two neighboring regions in any zone share the same color. Makes your map nice and clear. If you were a map maker wondering how many colors you'd need so that no neighboring regions on a map shared the same color, you'd quickly find that three colors wasn't enough for many maps. Like even something as simple as some center region and three regions outside it in a circle that all touch the center. We'd find if the center is one color, this would have to be a second color. This region touching both of those would have to be a third color. And this remaining region is touching all three and would have to be a fourth color. However, you'd also find that with more complicated maps, with more regions touching each other in a wider variety of ways, that four colors seemed to be just enough. That even with a super complicated map, even all of North America divided into cities or city-like regions, that if you did it just right, you could use just four colors to color it so that no two neighboring regions shared a color. 
So many mathematicians have wondered whether four or some other number is a maximum for how many colors any map might take to color under these rules. Like if there was no possible map you could design that would require more than four or some other special number of colors when colored in some ideal way. To mathematically prove something about a map may seem impossible with all of the different ways you could connect different shapes, but mathematicians know that there can be shortcuts, like interpreting different maps in terms of what's known as graph theory, not the type of graph on an XY coordinate plane, graph theory being a branch of math where you look at different nodes and let's put one node per different region right here. And then the ways that those nodes are connected. And sometimes the ways those nodes are colored, like we could imagine if we were to have colored one of these whole regions, coloring this little node inside it that color instead. Well, let's draw connections between any two regions that are touching. Like this region is touching that one and that one, but it's not neighbors with that, despite having a boundary line running between them. Similarly, this one is touching these two, but not that one. And if we fill in the rest of the connections, of regions that are neighbors with each other. And then we erase these outside map shapes. We can see that those two maps actually described the same graph, the same configuration of how different dots could be connected. And if we asked, how could we color different nodes depending on which ones were connected to each other so that no two nodes of the same color had a line between them? It turns out to be a simplified version of the map questions we were asking. And using these techniques, mathematicians in the late 1800s were not able to prove anything about four colors on a map quite yet, but they were able to prove that any map could be colored in five colors or fewer. Although this proof showed that any map had some way of coloring it with five or fewer colors, that wasn't the end of the questions because humans weren't able to find any map that required all five of those colors. Any map that humans were able to draw or construct mathematically seemed to have some way of coloring it with four or fewer colors. After a long period of mathematicians being unsuccessful at showing whether four colors might actually be the true maximum you'd need, finally in the 1970s, mathematicians, with the help of some computers in a somewhat controversial way at the time, managed to prove this. You see, mathematicians showed that if all of a large but finite list of graph configurations, many thousands of different arrangements of dots and lines, if each of those were four colorable, then every single map was. And then they needed the help from a computer to brute force check all of those thousands upon thousands of different arrangements, something that humans, not even a large team of humans would have been able to achieve. And the computers showed that all of those configurations were four colorable, or at least the computers said that and at the time when this paper was published, it was quite controversial in the mathematical community because computers hadn't been relied upon or trusted before in terms of a mathematical proof. We had relied on human brains, which certainly aren't infallible, 
but it raised a whole new question. To what degree is a computer program that claims itself that its answers are correct, but those answers being something that would take too long for any human to actually check, to what degree is that compatible or comparable to a human-created proof? Like, do we need to confirm a computer result on a different computer? or on a different type of computer running a different program, or on five or 10 different types of computers? And how does this raise questions about how we trust human brains on proofs as well? Do we trust a single mathematician's proof if that mathematician has some degree or has published stuff before? Or what's the number of humans or number of computers it would take to really trust something? Well, this raised a lot of questions. And in this particular case, this proof was checked by many other computer programs and at this point is pretty confidently believed to be correct that so many different types of computers and even further human developments on proofs have shown that maps are four colorable. Not only were mathematicians able to prove things about two-dimensional maps, but they were able to analyze three-dimensional and other sorts of structures as well. Like for a, for a, uh, for a sphere, we run around the sphere, it turns out that it's the same rules of four colors being the maximum, but that's not necessarily guaranteed for a three-dimensional shape. Perhaps a sphere gets almost lucky in having the same traits as a two-dimensional map. If we had analyzed something not quite a sphere, but like a torus, as it's not called, not a coffee cup. We're not getting that topological yet. A, a Taurus uh, that's more, uh, it's like a donut or bagel that, uh, for the viewer. A shape with one hole. And if we were to analyze drawing a map on a toroidal shape, like a bagel or donut, or technically a coffee cup, well, that doesn't require just four colors. That turns out to require seven colors for certain maps. Seven or fewer has been proven for the Taurus. And this number will vary for different sorts of shapes. <laughs> but the fact that it took so many years of wondering whether we could trust a computer before we trusted this result is gonna become more and more applicable because computers have helped with many other math problems since then. Capturing large batches of data with brute force that teams of humans wouldn't have the time to do. And a computer can't do that on their own, really. They need to be told by some human what they're looking for or what their data means. But with that combination of some computers and some humans, we can achieve a lot more nowadays mathematically than we used to be able to. And now that question holds true more than ever. To what degree do we trust a computer on a proof? And to what degree do we trust a human brain? So between ways in which computers have greatly helped with mathematics and ways in which computing devices will tell you utterly stupid, ridiculous things. <laughs> we live in an era where, oh, an era oh, where you have to be careful of when you want to trust the computer or not. Just remember that uh, this is your tool. You are not its tool. It needs your reasoning and greater scale common deduction skills for you to be able to take advantage of its calculation skills. 
and thank you to everyone who helps make this show possible, such as the squirrels and my Patreon supporters and everyone for watching. Thanks. I'll catch you all in the next episode.